So this is what I was mentioning about highly enriched uranium. So at weapon grade, you have you know only a modest amount of material uh, required. This is with a with a, uh, a beryllium reflector, um, and you can see the it stays pretty flat on the amount of material that you need uh, down to sort of 60 percent or so. At 60 percent, I think it's maybe two and a half, three times the amount that you need uh, here. But then it starts heading up pretty rapidly. And here's the 20 percent line. You st see, you can still make a you know, an explosive critical mass at less than 20 percent, but boy, you need a lot of material, and it's not really practical. All right, and there are a few other isotopes that you could imagine using in nuclear explosives. Uranium-233 is probably the, the main one of interest, because there are actually people who have some uranium-233. You produce that the same way like you produce plutonium. You use thorium. Uh, natural thorium is thorium-232. It absorbs a neutron and turns into uranium-233, just the way uranium-238 turns into plutonium-239. And there are a few things in the neptunium and the americium uh, zone that might be of interest someday, but hardly it, those are very hard to make, and hardly anybody has kilogram quantities of that stuff. I actually visited a place in Russia once uh, where they, had a, uh, they have a big vault with uh, that, you know, the reason I was visiting is I'd been involved in helping get cooperation going on securing all the material at this uh, site because they had about 80,000 disks, about yay big, that are made of either uh, weapon grade plutonium or weapon grade uranium. But they also had some neptunium and americium. And uh, so they had moved, the stuff used to be out on tables and stuff like that, uh, even at night when they weren't working with it. And so now it's all kept in a vault, you know, and there's all sorts of cameras and detectors and blah, 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 blah. It's much more secure. So anyway, they, I was getting a tour, and uh, we were going to the vault to see the vault where all the stuff was. And this, there are several kilograms of neptunium in there. And neptunium is hot as a pistol. Um, and uh, the guy said, you know, I should give you the briefing before we open the vault door. So, you know, he described what we were going to see. And he had a little radiation monitor, and we opened the door, and the radiation monitor just pegged over into the red zone the moment he opened the door. So we're like, oh, yeah, that's interesting. Okay, close the door. <laughs> yeah. um, all right, anyway, be that as it may. So what are the hard parts of making a bomb? Uh, making weapons usable nuclear material is the hard part, and we'll hear about that more uh, in a while. It's not impossible, um, but it's hard. Um, and that was more than 90% of the total spending floor space, etc., in the Manhattan Project was devoted to actually making the nuclear material rather than designing and manufacturing the bomb. You may not know this, but during the, the few years of the Manhattan Project, they actually built an industrial floor space that was more or less equal to the size of the U.S. auto industry at that time. Um, I mean, and the, the uranium enrichment plants at Oak Ridge, they were using bicycles to go from one end of the building to the other because the building was so gigantic. Uh, they were using up, I can't remember, some significant percentage of the total electricity consumption of the United States was going to those uh, facilities at Oak Ridge. Um, there's a great story of Roosevelt calling up the uh, guy who was chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee who was uh, from Tennessee uh, and saying, you know, we're, we have this big project. I can't tell you what it is, but it's possible to win the war for us, and you've got to hide the budget for it, you know, somewhere in the budget. And the guy said, I understand, Mr. President, and what part of the great state of Tennessee will this facility be located in? <laughs> Which is why it's at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Um, anyway, uh, so making the nuclear weapons efficient, safe, reliable, and able to be launched on missiles, the kind of thing that a state would want to have in its arsenal, is the other really hard thing. So you will often hear uh, people who have designed weapons for states saying it's impossible for a terrorist to make a nuclear bomb because they're thinking about the kind of weapon that they have designed for a state, which is really tricky to do and takes you know, a big team of scientists and you know, lots of R&D effort and, and so on and so on. It's much easier to make a crude, unsafe weapon that you might put in a truck or a yacht or something and you'd have no idea what its yield was going to be, uh, but it might be significant. Um, so that's why I do worry about terrorists making actual nuclear bombs. Designing and making a hydrogen bomb is very hard. Um, uh, with the, uh, as far as we know for sure, um, no country has ever done it without testing. It's at least possible 
that there is one country that has done so <laughs> without testing, uh, but I'm confident that country won't comment one way or the other since they don't acknowledge having nuclear weapons at all. I'm referring to Israel. Um, uh, there isn't any central secret, but there's a lot of various engineering challenges. So here are the hard parts for the crude terrorist bomb. First of all, of course, number one, probably number one, number two, and number three is getting the nuclear material. Once they have that, uh, you really have to worry. Uh, but there are other difficult parts. Processing the material into an appropriate form. It's probably unlikely that what they're going to get is, you know, uh, highly enriched uranium, 90% metal in the shape that they want for their nuclear blast. Uh, at least I hope they don't end up uh, getting that. So they'll probably have to do some processing on it. Uh, they might get, for example, highly enriched uranium research reactor fuel and have to separate out, say, aluminum and uranium bonded fuel so that they have just the uranium. Uh, casting and machining. Uh, is going to be a little bit tricky. Um, uh, uranium and especially plutonium are quite tricky uh, materials to machine. Pl plutonium has, what is it, five different crystalline states that it can exist in, That uh, six, okay, that have significantly different volumes and so on, and you have to stabilize it in the one you want, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, building the explosives and the reflector and so on and getting them to work, uh, especially for implosion weapons. Of the standard type, you would need the precision-shaped explosives with the extremely precise timing uh, uh, and to avoid making it into a pancake rather than into a denser ball. The neutron generator is actually a tricky part uh, for an implosion weapon in particular. For a gun-type weapon, in principle, you don't need it. Uh, it's reported, at least, that the South Africans didn't bother uh, with a neutron generator, but just relied on the neutrons that are naturally around. Uh, but with an implosion weapon, these explosives, once they've crushed it, you know, the shockwave will keep going and it'll, you know, sort of spread it around. The, uh, so you have to have a shower of neutrons at, at just the right time in order for it to go off properly, and that can be tricky to design. And all of that requires a, a, a sort of organizational capability. You have an or, need to have an organization that can recruit and train people with the right skills, that can raise a bunch of money. It's probably going to cost millions uh, to uh, even make you know, a crude terrorist nuclear bomb, um, and that can sort of sustain a project over time and keep people motivated over time. So I, I, I think actually the organizational aspects may be some of the hardest parts. There are some scenarios I won't talk about that might allow some of those steps to be uh, sidestepped. I will mention that at the Department of Energy, there are some facilities with some kinds of material where the security rules are that you have to set up your security system so that the bad guys can't even get into the building uh, because of concern that with the kinds of materials that exist in those buildings, they might be able to set off a nuclear bomb while they're still in the building before the responders manage to arrive. So I won't say any more about how that could possibly be true. But uh, So some technologies you'll see in the news sometimes that I just thought I'd mention. Crytrons, these are uh, devices that de deliver a powerful electrical signal with very precise timing. So they're for that detonation with millisecond timing all around. But they do have a bunch of civilian applications as well. You may remember that uh, back when Iraq had a real nuclear weapons program, uh, before 1991, they were buying lots of Krytrons and claiming they were for hospitals and, and uh, uh, things like that. There are various other ways you can uh, deliver that uh, signal to, uh, get the to get the detonations going. Neutron generators, I mentioned a moment ago, they're designed to set off a shower of neutrons at just the right moment. But imagine, you know, they're in the middle of all this explosion going on. So you have to make it so that it does its right thing as explosion is going on all around it. And that's not a little bit tricky to do. Um, X-ray flash photography is something you'll often see in, in sort of export control cases in the news. Uh, basically, uh, if you're designing one of these implosion systems, it helps to do some experiments. And to do the experiments, it helps to be able to see what the heck was happening in your experiments. But that requires being able to take, uh, you know, photographs incredibly fast of a, you know, an explosion taking place, basically. And so X-ray flash photography is what you use uh, for that purpose. Um, all of those are export controlled to some degree, but all of them also have civilian uh, uses.